Right. So I, I guess we could probably kick off. Um, yeah. The I I mean, while going through this chapter itself, at the very beginning, it seemed like a very complex chapter. But I kind of quickly realized that it's actually not that crazy. In fact, this chapter, the entire modeling, you know, uh, what would you call it? Now? The entire modeling thing that we want to understand, you can actually read model basics and many models. I think that kind of covers the idea of the chapter. Mm -hmm. this, this model building chapter itself just is, is like an extra information kind of chapter if you just want to go into a bit more detail. A okay. bit more detail without cutting into the detail. And I would, I would explain why the chapter kind of ends that way. You notice that at the very end of the chapter, um, there's a part that is called learning more about models. And what this is about is if you want to go into the actual detail of everything this chapter is talking about, you know, you can actually touch on some of these books itself. Interestingly, we actually have a class in, in R4DS um, Slack that touches on this introduction to statistical learning uh, uh, itself. Um, but the entire chapter was just like, it's like uh, a page after linear models, talking okay. about models, but not too much in depth. That's what this chapter is about. Right. So with that, I, I think we can actually finish pretty early. I think we can finish in like 20 minutes itself um, on, okay. on the data sets that we want to talk about. The first data set touches on diamonds, right? So we were walking through um, how do I build a model that um, uh, I can add predictions and how do I get to a place where I can actually fit my model itself? And the, the idea of the diamonds data set was you walk through adding residuals, right? So if you add residuals, you can get to a state where you can fit in your model. That's largely what what was trying to preach, right? This, this chapter tries to do exactly that same thing. So they work with that month, but a different data set, trying to answer a different question itself. And data set here is um, number of daily flights right, in New York City. Right. That's that's what we are we're talking about. And I mean, there isn't any major question that we're trying to answer. Uh, but yeah. the idea is trying to walk through the model to see if we can come up with like an hypothesis of something that we're actually aiming for um, at the end. So let, let's start from the very beginning. I know I've said quite a bit in the introduction, but let, let's start from the very beginning. So, right. so it says, so let's walk through a similar process for a, for a data set that seems simple. In this case, this is the number of flights that leave New York City per day, right? So it's a very small data set, 365 rows, covering the entire year and two columns. So the two columns will be the dates and the number of flights. Now you see the reason why this is going to be important as we go ahead, right? And um, realizing that after we go through this entire work, pretty much what I was trying to say at the introduction, we are not going to get to like a fully realized model, but what we are trying to do to learn in this chapter is the steps that allow us better understand the data itself, right? So it's just a, and the other thing I also figured out is depending on the thought process that you have, right? So if you have a different set of questions that you're aiming for, for a data set, you can actually approach this, this data set completely differently from what is here. But what this person was trying to answer with this particular data set was, um, as soon as I visualize it, can I actually understand what's happening in all of these spikes that are happening here, right? That's the hypothesis that the person kind of had. And that's the, that's the way the person approached this entire data set as they wanted to move forward, right? So let's start with running this data set through ggplot. Right? So we create daily, we run our flights data set. Uh, we try to summarize it and we come up with like a daily, right? So like this data set itself. So this shows up 365 rows, two columns. Right? It shows the dates, shows the number of flights per date. If we try to view that X and Y axis, we come up with a line, right? And, and obviously this looks quite scattered. It's kind of difficult for you to understand anything. Although there are some things that, you know, quite apparent here at the initial stage. 
but it will probably make a bit more sense if we can break this down itself into days of the week, right? So they said, understanding the long-term trend is challenging because there's a strong day of the week effect that dominates the subtler patterns, right? Um, then if we look at the distribution of flights by days of the week, things become a bit more cleaner compared to where we're coming from. I guess the immediate thing that will probably jump out here is there's definitely something to interpret for Sunday and Saturday, right? We're not sure what that thing is, but it kind of seems like Monday to Friday kind of ends up in the same bucket, you know, if you disregard all these outliers that are kind of happening here. But Sunday, Saturday, especially Saturday, seems like it's trying to show us something. And the first thing is, uh, there are fewer flights on weekends because most travel is for business. Now, this is the first assumption, right? That this individual is trying to do. Right. So there are obviously fewer flights that happens on, on Saturdays, but the question obviously is going to be, you know, why? Right? The effect is pronounced, heavily pronounced on Saturday. I think I left a note here. Let me see if I can remember what I added. Yeah, so we'll actually come back to this. At some point when we walk through this chapter, we'll come back to this, this particular graph again. So okay. again, the idea here is, I'm not, get, I'm not going to get a fully realized model here. We're just understanding the data itself. Right? Okay. So we create this with a box plot, right? Um, yeah. Right? Uh, so he said, you might sometimes live on a Sunday for a Monday morning meeting. Uh, but it's very rare that you leave on a Saturday as you might, you'd rather much spend time with your family, right? So this is why trying to make a judgment call for you know, why there are fewer flights on these two days. But the more we dig into the model, you know, the more it's kind of, some things will kind of be a bit more apparent. So one way to remove this strong pattern, right? This strong pattern that we're seeing here is to use a model. And obviously coming from the chapter, this model basic chapter, the idea of walking through a model starts from fitting the model itself, right? And generating levels of predictions that we overlay on the original data. Because the top process there is at least those predictions will kind of show us or give us an indication for where we are likely going to end up. So we walk through the shortcut here. We run this through a linear regression, a linear model, right? So the X and Y axis and the data here is, is daily. Going through a grid, this will become quite important when you actually want to visualize itself, right? So then we'll run this grid with digit plot, right? Then we make whatever prediction that we're trying to do to be the red. And you can clearly see what that represents, right? So let's just keep going. So after we fit the model where we generate some predictions, let's generate some residuals, right? So pretty much the same data sets that we're starting with, the daily data sets. We add residuals. We learned about this in the previous chapter. We now run that through ggplot again. And now we have this. Now this becomes quite interesting because the idea of residuals here is, are we over predicting? Are we under predicting? And you notice that there are obviously a number of spikes that we have between January and March. Seems like we are predicting something that is actually not showing up in, in the data set itself. And you also notice that there are some huge spikes at some points during the year. Right? So obviously not the change in the y-axis, right? Uh, the labeling the y-axis itself. We are seeing deviation from the expected number of lights during the week. And I think the way I interpreted this was for this first act, anything that is below zero shows that we are predicting that a flight happens, but it actually did not happen. Right. Um, yeah, so exactly. It's, yeah, you're right. Perfect. Great. I was, <laughs> so that's kind of how I interpreted it. Thanks for that. Um, so it says here that you notice that our model starts failing in June. I mean, failing in quotes, right? Because we are calling these spikes failures one, two, three, four, five, six of them. Right. But as we kind of go on, um, and again, this is why I said it heavily depends on the data set you're working with. You can actually dis decide to exclude this data set. Why? Um, I think we'll come back to it at the end. 
But the reason is because we kind of identify that this, this pointers kind of shows that they are public holidays in America, right? And I mean, there are not too many of them. They're just six, six points itself that I could probably exclude. Again, depending on the deficit they are working with here. So our model seems to start failing in June. You will still see a strong regular pattern that our model hasn't captured itself. So this, everything around here that is below this zero, right? So drawing a plot with eight line for each day of the week makes this easier to see. So now let's now do it on the daily basis itself. So instead of seeing it on this basis, let's see on the Sunday, Monday, all the way days of the week, right? So you notice that there are certain days of the week that are obviously below the zero point. Number one is going to be the Sunday, number two is going to be the Saturday, right? So our model fails to accurately predict the number of lights on Saturday. So if I try to trace Saturday, uh, it should be a lot more below the zero point. So I think it's heavy, this heavy, um, heavy pink line. Yeah, I, I mean, if, if it's, I, I think um, the error rate uh, or the deviation, either mm -hmm. above or below. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, even if it's above, it's also over predicting. I see. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I can see. So since this this guy is yeah heavily above zero, exactly. So it's over predicting. Yeah. Okay. Fair. So our model fails to accurately predict the number of flights on Saturday. During summer, so that would be like in June, July, August itself, there are more flights that we, than we expect. And during fall, there are fewer, right? We will see how we can do better to capture this pattern in the next section, right? Uh, there are some days with far fewer flights than expected. So, so if you want to draw out everything that is you know, below this um, 100 itself, uh, we can actually pull that out. And it kind of shows that there are certain days, 1st of January, 20th, 20, 20th of January, 26th, 4th of July, 5th July, um, and 1st September, right? And so that's, these are the points I was trying to flag that you notice that this kind of coincides with American public holidays itself. So New Year Day, July 4th, Thanksgiving, Christmas, things like that, right? There are some others that don't seem to co correspond to public holidays. You would work on those in this exercise, in one of the exercises, fantastic. Right, so, so, so at least we are beginning to understand that certain things might not be clean in our data set itself. Mm. So let's try to go into like the next step itself, right? So the next step says, there seems to be some smoother long-term trend over the course of the year. So if you try to run like a smooth line, so at least there seems to be some level of the trend over the course of the year itself, right? There are a few, oh, few in January right? and in December and more in between May and September. So this period itself, right? So it says we can't do much with this pattern quantitatively because we only have a single year of data, but we can use our domain knowledge to brainstorm on potential explanations, right? Um, so now, now let's now go back to the Saturday effect, right? So let's first tackle our failure to accurately predict the number of flights on Saturday. I think we kind of saw that show up here. Okay. A good place to start is to go back to the raw numbers, focusing on just Saturdays. And so we run that through our daily, our daily data sets, then we now do a filter for the weekday that is just Saturday. Right, then create a ggplot on that, and that gets us to see this. Okay. So it says, I've used both points and lines to make it more clear what the data and what is the, what is data and what is interpolation, right? So I suspect that this pattern is caused by summer holidays. My, many people go on holidays in the summer, right? Uh, and people don't mind traveling on Saturdays for vacation. Looking at this plot, we might guess that summer holidays are from early June to late August. So that would probably be this bucket itself. Okay. So why are there more Saturday flights in the spring than in the fall? Right. If I, if I even get there, let me talk about this point I highlighted. Right. So that seems to line up fairly well with the state school terms, summer break 
2013 was June 26 to September. So that's what this is kind of trying to represent. Again, so this, this is like an hypothesis that this person is trying to make, right? Trying to understand like what's going on in this information. Like they explained here, you probably can't do much with this pattern quantitatively. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so we're just left with like hypothesis creation, coming up with like different ideas. So I think this will become a bit more familiar if you have idea of the movements in American dates, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this is quite interesting. The fact that summer break happens June 26, September 9th, this point. So, and if we say that, you know, people don't mind traveling on Saturday for vacation, and these are vacation periods, you could probably see the reason why there are a lot of flights that happen in that period itself. Um, so the other question is, what the most Saturday flights in the spring than in the fall, right? Um, and he said he asked for my American friends and he suggested it's less common to plan family vacation during the fall because of the big things in at this time. Impressive, right? Mm. So most people don't plan vacation during this period itself, mm. largely because of Thanksgiving and Christmas on the days. So obviously we don't have data to show that for sure, but kind of seems like a sensible hypothesis in a way, right? Yeah. Uh, so let's now do a bit of digging. I think this is like the final bit, I think, of the major work. I think everything else after, outside this, I think we'll talk about all the way till we get here. Everything outside this was now going into a bit more details if you want to learn a bit more about models, which I don't think is what this book is about. Um, so I think everything from these computed variables all the way down to this is like extra rich in case you kind of want to go into a bit more detail. So, oh, okay. So this, this code is kind of the last thing that we'll probably touch trying to understand what this represents. It's, uh, okay. The idea here was let's create a term variable to kind of see if we can capture these school terms that we've talked about, right? Okay. Uh, with our plots and we divide it into spring, summer, or pop. Right, so we create a term variable, create a function. We are cutting this date into this particular date itself, right? And we're now labeling spring, summer, fall, right? Mm. Uh, run our, our daily data sets. We create a new colon, then we now you know visualize it. So filter out same Saturday, ggplot, visualize it in a point and line. So now, now at least we can cut out everything that we did here. Mm -hmm. It's now labeled in terms of spring, summer, fall. So at least we can see that division. The entire description that was trying that was being labeled here. Exactly. Yeah. So, so this would be spring, this would be summer, and this would be fall. Um, then uh, it's useful to see how this new variable, so this new term variable, affects the other days of the week. So let's let's take a step back to create it for like every other days of the week. So this is what Saturday represented. We really kind of saw that graduation work. So spring, summer, fall, we can see the same thing. Or mm -hmm. maybe other, right? So it looks like there is significant variation across terms, right? Obviously. Um, so fitting a separate days of the week effect for each term is reasonable. Uh, this improves our model, but not as much as we might hope. So let's, let's try to fit this separate days of the week effect for each day of the week itself and see if that actually works. So again, we go the shortcut routes using a linear model function here. Uh, we gather our residuals with each of the, uh, the new variables that we have created, mode one and mode two. Um, uh, and I, and that, that ends up here. So we can see the data set without this term which is very similar to what we saw in our very first graph. Mm. And that set with, with term, which has a bit more explanation. But yeah, I mean, it should coincide, but we see that, you know, it's not necessarily coinciding itself. And we yeah. can see it by overlaying the prediction from the model and the raw data. Mm. So let's create a grid, there are grid add, add predictions on that mode to itself, call it N, then run that GG plot. Then we can now see what this represents where each of these predictions actually kind of end up. Mm. So the explanation here, I think one of the things this was trying to flag was 
everything that is happening before and why why our predictions are not being as clear as possible to what our mm. initial right so he said our model is finding the mean effect right but we have a lot of big outliers uh, so the mean tends to be far away from the typical value and we can alleviate this problem by using a model that is robust to the effect of outliers itself and that's now like a variation of this function it is now this mass our lm function right so we try to do everything that we did up here, right? But now we are using this mass RLM function to remove the effects of the outliers because this function probably can do a bit more to take care of our outliers. So pretty much the same thing. Uh, and now we can see that we are getting very close. So like the way we had described before, above zero, below zero, things kind mm. of look fairly close. Our prediction kind of look fairly yeah. close, although there's some, so but is this guy to match still unexplainable? <laughs> this mm. this spikes that we have, at least now we understand it that is you know it's public holidays. So mm. expect that the spike itself. And mm. it, this ending period itself, the, the end of the year, still showing some huge variations itself. But now it's it's much variable to see that long-term trend and the positive and negative um, outliers. Right? Yeah. So, so in total, while reading through this this chapter, I kind of realized that. You can actually view it in two ways. But one is there isn't that much to pick from this chapter if you are not that interested in going through like, like modeling work itself. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I also realized is the functions that were created in this chapter, I think there are very few of them that will end up being very useful. Um, like, like very useful in terms of if you are dealing with different data sets. Mm -hmm. But most of the functions that are here are heavily created for the thought process around how this individual wanted to walk through this particular, you know, days flights data sets yeah, itself. Um, but the, the, the major principle still applies. A is the idea of fitting a model um, and the idea of using residuals itself that the, model, that the book was trying to preach in terms of model basics. And residuals kind of gives you an idea of where things actually fall, especially on mm. the wire. So you know if you're over predicting or under predicting. And if, if what you are trying to solve for in a data set is kind of to get there itself to get a prediction, then that over prediction or that prediction can, can be your way that you actually approach the entire work uh, itself. And using residuals as a way to get there, you know, kind of is, is probably a cleaner way to kind of let you understand your data sets and get to like a fitted model. Itself. Exactly. The other thing I also figured out was the idea of using out visualization in model building itself, right? So you could run through this entire work of getting to a fitted model without actually visualizing it. But you just notice that as you keep walking through a number of things, it probably makes a bit more sense for you to run it through this two plot. For you to kind of come up with maybe some thought processes that or hypothesis that you might have. An example is like all these questions I think we're trying to ask here. Right? Um, it kind of gives you a bit more idea if you're hypothesizing a bit more good visualization. So I, I realized that we'll probably learn a bit more about models when we go into this Paul and Broom. So this is probably a bit more applicable to, to the R for DS uh, book uh, because it's teaching a bit more about functions. But this chapter is a lot more about model building itself, doubling down on the need to use visualization and doubling down on um, uh, uh, you need to use residuals as a way to get to your um, uh, prediction itself. And we kind of did that using two data sets. So the diamond data set and the NYC flights um, data set. So, 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 so that's, the, that's the end of the entire chapter. The, the many bits is now, if want to go into a bit, more, a bit more detail. So if you're experimenting with many models and with many visualization, and if you also want to learn more about modeling itself, Right, then you can actually read any of these books itself. And again, interestingly, we actually have a, a class on this introduction to statistical learning itself. So that's that's kind of where I ended uh, itself. So I guess next time we'll probably go into many models and end this particular um, particular piece of the book itself. 
fantastic. Okay. You you really you've done a great job. I mean, yeah, that's thank you so much. Thank you very much, Chief. So I'm I'm very happy. It's a very short class. Um, I think yeah. I think the next class is pretty much the same thing. The only okay. difference is it does go into a more detail of mm -hmm. particular functions itself. So so this poor um room function, and okay. I think we'll probably take things a bit more slower. Although it's the the thought process is very similar to the model building model basics. It's just how do you now fit in these two functions to actually work. Okay. Through. Okay. So, so who's taking next class? Um, I think it should still be me. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, that will probably take this. Then uh, Mariana comes in to take to communicate the final oh, okay. part. Oh, okay. 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 No problem. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Chief. Yeah. That was very good. Aitza.